Good morning. It is good to see you on this, uh, I know it's July 5th, but we'll call it the July 4th weekend, the holiday. It is glad to see you guys, and I know we're a little more sparse this morning because of the holiday weekend than we normally are, but it is good to see you as we gather together. This morning, we will be doing something a little bit different. As we've done the last couple of years on the weekend closest to July 4th, we have spent time as a church praying for our nation. We have spent time thanking the Lord for the blessings we have as a country, and we have spent time before our Lord interceding and praying on behalf of our country and our nation. And this morning, that's what we're going to do. It will not be a normal service. There will not be a sermon. But we are going to spend time in worship. We're going to spend time singing. We're going to spend time praying this morning for our, for our country. As those who have received God's grace, and we have received, as those who have received God's forgiveness through the work of Christ, you and I are part of a people and a kingdom that spans the nations and the centuries. We are united with the Jewish believers of the first century, with the Greek and the Roman believers of the Mediterranean world of the Roman Empire. We are united in one with the African believers from biblical Ethiopia to modern day South Africa and all points in between. We are united and one people as believers in Christ as part of the kingdom of God with believers from Russia and Germany and England and throughout Europe from the Middle Ages to today. South America, the nations of the South Pacific to East Asia, from New Guinea to the Philippines, you and I are united in one people with those who have trusted Christ from all around the world. There are myriads and throngs of people that you and I are one nation with because of our faith in Christ and members of the kingdom of God from around the globe and throughout history. Right here in London, Arkansas, we are part of something much bigger we are with all these people, one people, one united in one spirit with one Lord and one Savior, one kingdom. But even as we are united with all believers throughout all these countries and without, throughout all of history, we also are a part, as were many of them, part of a unique nation with a history and a story all our own. As citizens of the United States, we are thankful and grateful for all that we possess, and we recognize that Scripture tells us to respect our government and to love our people, our fellow Americans, and our shared history and our nation. We see and know the significant role that believers in Christ have played in the formation and the preservation and the governance of this country. How believers in Christ have shaped our culture and our philosophy and that we recognize God's blessings and providence in the history of our nation. So it's right, I believe, that we pause this weekend to celebrate, to give thanks for the nation we call home and for the freedoms that we possess. Freedoms that we possess, by the way, given to us, not to serve ourselves, but freedom to accomplish the will and the purposes of God and His kingdom. Maybe this weekend you have celebrated our nation's independence with things like fireworks, grilled burgers and hot dogs, time spent with family. Maybe you've even sung the national anthem this weekend, or you've, for those of you who are really ambitious, maybe you've even reread the Declaration of Independence. As the people of God, we give thanks. There's little more that we could do this morning than to worship the God of all nations and to pray for our people, the people of the United States of America, as we give thanks, and lift them up and lift up our nation before the Lord. This morning, we're going to let Scripture guide our prayers, for God has given us ways in His Word to lift up and to celebrate ways to pray for those that we love, ways to pray for our nation. 
So this morning, over the next 45 minutes or so, you will hear various people read some scriptures and be praying for different parts of our nation and offering different prayers. So we will be singing and praying and reading scripture this morning, and that will be the most of what we do. We'll celebrate and recognize God as king over our nation. We will recognize that he is sovereign above all. We will recognize that's a good thing. We will, as always, intercede and confess, confess our sins. We will intercede for those who do not know him and for our nation. And we will give thanks for the actions and the wisdom of God in all things. Why do we pray? Because prayer is vital. We'll see a video here, and we'll have our first prayer. I think it's interesting that in the church today, so many of us ask, why is prayer necessary? And we don't ask it, but we really don't show with our lives that prayer is necessary. And so we show with our lives that we're asking, why is prayer necessary? You know why I think we ask that question? Because you don't need prayer when you're watching TV. And we don't need prayer when we're mindlessly surfing the internet. You don't need prayer then. You don't need prayer when there's nothing at stake in your walk with Christ. You don't need prayer when there's no risk in Christianity. You don't need prayer when Christianity consists of monotonous religious motion of routine week in and week out. You don't need prayer for that. You can do that on your own. But when you risk everything, to glorify Jesus Christ, you need prayer. When you sacrifice your possessions and your dreams and your hopes and your career and you lay it all on the line and you stake your reputation down on your allegiance to Christ, you need prayer. When your longing day in and day out is to lead people to faith in Christ, you need prayer. You rely on prayer. You are desperate for prayer because you're devoted to his mission. And when the aim of your life is to affect as many people with the gospel of Christ for the glory of Christ, you will find yourselves given over to prayer. I'd like to begin with a quote from the great poet Kanye, Jesus is my king. Who's more than that? He is our king. He's the king of America. He is the king of all nations. Uh, so uh, Daniel 2, 21. It is he who changes the times and epochs. He removes kings and establishes kings. Romans 13, 1 and 2 tells us, every person is to be in subjugation to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And those who exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and who and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. Acts, thir Acts seventeen twenty six says, and he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined that appointed times and boundaries and their habitation. Isaiah 41, verse 2. Who has aroused from the east, whom he calls in righteousness to his feet? He delivers up nations before him and subdues kings. He makes them like dust with a sword, as the wind-driven chaff with his bow. Pray with me, family. Oh, Jesus, you are king over all kings. There is no higher authority. You reign in absolute. Your dominion is infinite. We bow down only to you and look forward to the day when every knee will bow. Clearly, <coughs> you are the ruler over all creation. Amen. Amen.
Amen. Thank you, Mike. Let's stand and sing and worship.
seated as we continue with our time this morning of prayer and worship the fact that God is king and that his reign will never be shaken it's a foundation for everything else that we believe and say and do we know that his reign lasted or began before the foundations of the earth began and will be there long after it's done so we rest and we rely upon that. But because he is king, we also recognize that as we, his people, we have not always obeyed our king. In both Nehemiah and in Daniel, we see men of God that he used to do great things for his people. Upon confronting the living God, prayed prayers on behalf of their nation. Now, in Nehemiah and in Daniel's case, their nation was the people of Israel. But both these men, righteous men that God used in mighty ways, prayed prayers. And their prayers in asking the Lord to work among the people of Israel were mostly prayers of confession and repentance. And we, you and I would look at Nehemiah and we would look at Daniel and go, well, what did they have to particularly confess? Well, these men probably by our standards and by even the standards of the people of their day were righteous men who probably were not guilty, it would seem, of some of the things they confessed and yet they prayed as representatives of their people. The truth is, Scripture is full of one interceding and confessing the sins on behalf of another. Judah took responsibility for the supposed crimes of Benjamin and confessed sin and took responsibility before Joseph. Nehemiah and Daniel do this, and ultimately our faith rests on this idea that Jesus took upon him our sin. So let me read for you briefly from these two, and we will confess our sins as a, as a people before our Lord this morning. Nehemiah, upon hearing about the state of Jerusalem in, a, in ruins during the time of the Babylonian captivity, said this, I sat down and I wept and mourned for days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I said, I beseech you, Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who preserves the covenant and loving kindness for those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear be now attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant, which I am praying before you day and night on behalf of the sons of Israel. Confessing the sins of the sons of Israel, the sins that we have sinned against you, I and my father's house. We have acted corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments nor the statutes or the ordinances which you have commanded your servant, Moses. In the book of Daniel, in Daniel chapter 9 in particular, Daniel is looking out and realizing that the time has come for the people of Israel to be allowed to go back to the promised land, to go back to Israel. And he says this in Daniel chapter 9, verse 4, I prayed to the Lord my God, and confessed and said, Alas, O Lord, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant and loving kindness for those who love him and keep his commandments, we have sinned, committed iniquity, acted wickedly and rebelled, even turning aside from your commandments and ordinances. Now, we might argue that Daniel didn't do that. Daniel was a faithful man, and yet he prayed that as if he is the one who had done it, as he prayed for his people. This morning, as we spend some time as God's people, confessing and acknowledging before God that we have sinned, you may think to yourself, well, I haven't done some of those things. Well, maybe you haven't. I don't know. The Scripture does say, though, if you've broken one of God's commandments, you have broken all of them. But you may be tempted to think, whether you're here this morning with us or you're online, well, I haven't done those things. 
maybe. But we as a people, whether it be as a church, all believers called by Christ's name, or even as a country, we have. And so this morning, we can hardly ask God's favor and blessing and forgiveness if we aren't first ready to acknowledge where we've been wrong. And above all people, the people of God should be the first to acknowledge where sin exists and not the last. So would you please join with me in prayer? Father, you are the one who, as Daniel and Nehemiah both said, keep covenant. You are a God of loving kindness and grace and forgiveness who has made promises to those who have trusted your name and you are king. And this morning, we depend on all those. And yet we acknowledge that as king, we have not obeyed your commands. Lord, I would begin by confessing that as a church, as the people of God, here in London and Arkansas and throughout the United States, that as a people of God, we have sinned. Lord, we have had pride. We have attempted to do things for the kingdom on our own strength and to take credit for our own name and not yours. Lord, we have been angry and divisive towards one another, falsely accusing. We have gossiped. Lord, we have spread rumors and we have spread conspiracies and we have spread lies about one another and even about those who do not know you. Our lives, our lips have been the lips of liars at times. Lord, we have been immoral and we endorsed immorality. We have turned from your word and Lord, we as the people who have called you by name have so often worshipped ourselves and not you. Lord, we're sinners. And Lord, we also confess that as a nation, though we are simply another nation that has existed throughout the history of, of this earth, and we are one of many nations even today, we recognize that there has been a great deal of work done by your people in the formation and preservation of this country. We are thankful for the results of that. But yet, Lord, as a nation, we recognize that we have sinned against you. Hatred and violence and pride, immorality, idolatry, sins of dishonoring you and hating one another. Lord, we have hated one another for economic reasons, for education reasons, for racial reasons. Lord, we have spread lies and we have demonized one another. We have been violent and we have turned our backs upon you in every conceivable way as a nation. And Lord, acknowledging our sins this morning as believers in Christ, as members of the kingdom of God, and even as the people of the, America, of the American nation, we this morning ask that you would forgive. That you would extend grace, not because we have deserved it, not because we have earned it, not because there is anything about our natural resources or even our government that merits your activity, but because, Lord, you are a gracious God worthy to be worshipped and proclaimed. Lord, we have used the freedoms we have been given for selfish gain and not for the purposes of the kingdom. Forgive us. We have nothing that would commend us to you that we often think highly of ourselves. Lord, we beg this morning as your people, have mercy, have grace, and use us to extend it. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand again and continue worship. Marvelous 
grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilled. And dark is the stain that we cannot hide. What can avail to wash it away? Look, there is flowing a crimson tide, whiter than snow you may be today. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. A marvelous, infinite, matchless grace is freely bestowed on all who believe. All who are longing to see His face, will you this moment His grace receive grace grace god's grace grace that he'll pardon and cleanse within grace grace god's grace grace that is greater than all our sin grace grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within, grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin, it's grace that is greater than all our sin. Grace that is greater than all our sin. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the of glory died. My richest gain I count but lost and poor content on all my pride. From his hand, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did as such love and sorrow. so amazing 
so divine demands my soul my life and my all amen maybe see you Next, we'll be pray- praying for our, our leaders, and uh, that's at the state level, the local level, and at the uh, national level. And before we pray for them, I'm going to read a couple of scriptures for us. First Peter 2.17 says, To show proper respect to everyone, love the family of believers, fear God, and honor the emperor. Jeremiah 29.7, Also seek the peace and prosperity of the king to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. First Timothy 2, 1 and 2 says, First of all, then, I urge you that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings, and all who are in high positions, so that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. Let's pray. Oh God, we Lift up our nation today. Thank you, Lord, for the freedom you have given us, the grace you have shown us, and the love that you have for us. I pray, Lord, that today you will be with our nation's leadership, our local, state, and national government leaders that you have put in place. I lift up our Mayor Eddie Price and Mayor Richard Harris, that you would give them wisdom and discernment on how best to prevent the spread of this disease that continues to grow here in Pope County as well as the many other challenges that they face. I lift up Governor Asa Hutchison, Senators Tom Cotton, John Bozeman, and Representatives Steve Womack, French Hill, Rick Crawford, and Bruce Westerman, as they also search for the best way to slow the spread of this coronavirus, and that you would give them your eyes and your heart as they represent the people of Arkansas against injustices in our nation. Lord, I also pray for Donald Trump and Vice President Mike Pence. I ask that you guide our president in the policies and the statements that he makes concerning our nation, that he would be used as an instrument of your peace, your truth, and your justice. In a time where our nation is so hurting, so broken, and so divided, Lord, please use these civic leaders to fulfill your will. And Lord, help us not to find our identities in political parties or in these men, but in your name. You are the Lord of all peoples, and I pray for your image bearers here in Pope County and the surrounding area. Lord, that you would begin a revival in this area. Thank you, Lord, that no matter what man or what woman is in charge, we can rest in the fact that you have set leaders and nations up and that you use all things for your glory and that your name might be made known. Amen. As we have prayed for those who are in positions of leadership in our nation, we also want to pray for those who are tasked with serving and protecting those of us who live here. I want to read for you from 2 Chronicles chapter 32, verse 6. God, speaking to the people of Israel, says this, He that is God appointed military officers over the people and assembled them, encouraged them with these words, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid and dis- or discouraged because of the king of Assyria and the vast army with him. With him only is the arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God and help us and to help us and to fight our battles. Our nation has been blessed with those who have given their lives and given of their time to protect us. I want to take a few moments this morning to pray for our military and its leadership, to pray for our police and their leadership, as well as emergency responders of every kind. Would you please bow with me? Heavenly Father, we are this morning, as has already been mentioned, been blessed by your kingship and of and your setting up of authority to protect and order our society. Lord, you've also provided those who would protect and to serve those for a greater good than themselves. And we ask this morning, that you would have your hand upon our military, its leaders, our police officers, 
emergency responders such as firefighters and others. So, Lord, you would grant them courage from you and a dependence upon your preservation. So, Lord, they would not rely upon their own strength, they would rely upon yours. So, Lord, you would give them perseverance to endure hardship. That you would give them divine protection from those who would work against your purposes. So, Lord, you would grant those who are in leadership of these areas wisdom and how to direct them to to carry out their responsibilities, whether it be on the international field or whether it be at home. Give them the ability to respect those whom they serve of all races and of all kinds. Lord, give them confidence and vision that their task is one that you have set up, that they would be persistently good. Lord, provide protection and support for their families as they serve. Lord, provide peace for the spouses and for the children and for the parents of those who are serving you overseas or even in law enforcement or fire protection or other first responders in this country that you would provide them peace and rest in you. Lord, I pray for those who serve as chaplains to the military and to the police and to emergency responders that they would have wisdom, they would be the means of, of hope and peace and spiritual strength for those who serve. And that, Lord, we would never fail to lift them up and to pray. Lord, use these men and women to accomplish your purposes, to provide justice for all people, to provide protection and safety for all people. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You're the king of these people. You're the Lord of this nation. You are. You're the light in the darkness. You're the hope to the hopeless. You're the peace to the restless. You are. For there is no one like our God. There is no one like you, God. For greater things have yet to come. Greater things are still to be done in this city. Yes, greater things have yet to come. Greater things are still to be done in this city. Greater things have yet to come. Greater things are still to be done here. You're the Lord of creation, the creator of all things. You're the king above all kings. You are. You're the strength and the weakness. You're the love to the broken. And you're the joy in our sadness. You are. For there is no one like our God. No, there. There's no one like you, God. Greater things have yet to come, and greater things are still to be done in this city. Greater things have yet to come, and greater things 
there's still to be done in this city. Greater things have yet to come and greater things are still to be done here. For there is no one like our God. There is no one like you, God. There is no one like our God. There is no one like you, God. Greater things have yet to come. Greater things are still to be done in this city. Where glory shines from hearts alive with praise to you and love for you in this city. Greater things have yet to come and greater things are still to be done in this city. This greater things have yet to come and greater things are still to be done here. For there is no one like our God. There is no one like you, God? Would you join me as we pray for the church? Um, a couple of scriptures to start us off. Ephesians 6.18 says this, Pray at all times in the Spirit with every prayer and request, and stay alert with all perseverance and intercession for all the saints. And then 1 Thessalonians uh, 1.2 says, We always thank God for all of you, making mention of you constantly in our prayers. And then Colossians chapter 1, verse 3, and then verses 9 through 12 we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. For we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all the saints. For this reason also, since, we, since the day we heard this, we haven't stopped praying for you. We are asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, so that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience, joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has enabled you to share in the saints' inheritance in the light. Would you join me in prayer? Father God, we come before you with humility and with a willingness to obey. We thank you for establishing your church to carry on your work in the world. We pray for the knowledge and understanding of your will so our lives may honor and glorify you through your church. May we be encouragers and uplifters. Grant us unity that we may be one as you, God the Father, and Jesus, your Son, are one. We thank you that you take the many individual parts and piece them together so they function as the body of Christ. May each person fulfill their role and purpose in your plan. God, help our church body to walk in a manner worthy of the calling you have given us. Help us to bear fruit as we live in this world and as we share our hope with those we encounter. Help us to trust you and your power and to live in and through your strength. We are hopeless and helpless in our own ability, but with you we can do all things. Give us patience and endurance to fight the battle for the long haul, even through hard times, difficulties, and suffering, all of which are inevitable in this life. May we not fear but trust in your provision. When we are being attacked and crushed from all sides, remind us of your faithfulness to use everything for your good and your glory. 
May we walk humbly with you, God, allowing you to show us our wrongs. Lord, you have told us in your word that you hear our prayers. We cry out to you, humbling ourselves before you, seeking your face. We repent and turn from our wicked ways. Thank you for your forgiveness and healing. We desire to be more like you, willing to deny self and follow you wholeheartedly. May we increasingly look more like you the longer we walk with you. Help us to point to you and to point others to you as the light we need in this dark world. In the name of Jesus, your son, we pray. Amen. Let's stand. What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus for my life is wholly bound to him oh how strange and divine i can sing all is mine yet not i but through christ in me sure the price it has been paid for Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon and he was raised to overthrow the grave to this I hold my sin has been defeated for Jesus now and ever my plea oh the chains are released i can sing i am free yet not i but through christ in me with every breath I long to follow Jesus, for he has said that he will bring me home. And day by day, I know he will renew me until I stand with joy before the throne. And to this I hold my hope is only jesus oh all the glory evermore to him when the race is complete still my lips shall repeat yet not i but through christ in me when my race is complete still my lips shall repeat yet not i but through christ in me yet not i but through christ in me be seated. I know Brother Brett said he wasn't going to preach, but no one said I wasn't. So after all, there is coronavirus. You're not going to be able to beat the Methodists to the restaurants anyway, maybe to the drive-thru. Um, 
God kind of spoke to me when just preparing for this. And when uh, I was assigned the part to pray for the lost, I began to question and think about what that meant. And uh, I want to want to kind of make you broaden your perspective here. I want you to think about it like this. Who are the lost? Now, there's obvious answers to who are the lost. We like to look out there in the world at all the sinners and think about those people who don't have Christ. And true, they are part of the lost. But uh, the Lord led me to some scripture here that uh, some parables that he told. In Matthew 15, excuse me, Luke 15 is where I am. Bear with me. You find three parables that Christ told. It was the parable of the lost sheep. It was the parable of the lost coin and the parable of the lost son. And I began to look at those because, after all, those were things that were lost. And I said, maybe the Lord wants us to include these lot type of loss, not just those that are out there that have never come to know Christ. Uh, in those parables, I want to read verse 4, verse 8, and verse 11, one from each of the parables. In the parable of the lost sheep, verse 4 says, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? Then in verse 8, Verse 8, in the parable of the lost coin, he says, Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And then verse 11, in the parable of the lost son, then he said, A certain man had two sons, two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Give me the portion of goods. That falls to me. So he divided them his livelihood. When we look at these three verses and we see who are these lost, that last one said it was one of his sons. It was already part of the family. So it began me, it made me begin to think about our church family and who are our lost in our community. Yes, it's those out there who have never come to know Christ, but it is also those who were with us that are no longer with us. The parable of the lost son, I mean, that's a well-known parable it's somebody who kind of drifted away didn't it okay so when you think about praying for the lost don't just think about those out there who don't know christ but think about those that we had in our possession the coin was in the lady's possession okay the sheep were among us and they're no longer with us okay those are part of the loss so when we pray for the lost which we will hear we need to make sure that we include those kind of people as well okay Next question I had was, okay, that's who the lost are. Then how or what do we pray for for them? How, you know, what, what concerning the lost should we pray? And surprisingly, we're looking at these three parables. We find that the focus is not on the lost, but on the individuals who have lost the lost, the ones who are still with us, the shepherd who goes out looking for that lost sheep. The focus is on what is he to do? How is he to pray? The lady, what does she do when she loses the coin? Goodness, she turns up the whole house looking for that lost coin. And I got thinking, how are we or are we looking for our lost? Are we as putting as much effort in finding those lost that, are, uh, that we have? Okay. So uh, looking at that, uh, verse 4, 8, and 20 again tells what they did. In verse 4, it says, left the 99 to go find the one. Verse 11 says, uh, excuse me, verse 8 says, lit a lamp and swept the whole house. And then actually look in verse 20 of the parable of the lost son. It said, he rose and he came to his father. This is the pr uh, prodigal son. But when he was still a great way off, what did the father do? He had compassion and he ran and he fell on his neck and he kissed him. Picture this dad looking for that lost son. He had to be standing in that doorway for a long time, every day, waiting, watching for that lost one. So it kind of gives us some guidelines as to what maybe and how we should pray concerning these lost. First of all, we should never leave out those that are more a part of us, not just those who have never come to salvation. And then we should make major efforts to find those lost. Okay, And then... If you will, 
verse, I want to look over Matthew 9 and look at one more set of scripture. Over Matthew 9, verses 36 through 38. It said that when he saw the multitudes, this is Jesus, he was moved with, there's that word compassion again, compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. This is the lost people. Okay. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Get to thinking, okay, maybe the one other concept that we need to pray for when we're praying for the lost is for the laborers to go out and find them. How about that? So keeping in that mi in mind, let's uh let's go to the Lord in prayer and pray for the lost. Heavenly Father, we know this world is full of of folks that, Father, that you, that you basically say is your is our enemy, those who do not belong to you, Father, they are enemy. But you tell us another scripture to love our enemy, to do good for them, Father, to help them, Father. So we know the world is full of those folks out there and in our community that do not have Christ, and yes, they are part of the lost. And we pray for them. We pray that Lord, you would bring folks into their lives that would point and direct them to your son Jesus father we pray that circumstances would occur in their lives that they would have no other choice but to turn and look for you father for they are lost and they do need to be found and father we pray that uh, as you said there in Matthew that you would bring forth more laborers to work alongside us father and that we like the the lady and the shepherd and the father in the parables would also be about seeking to find those that are lost, that we would be putting major effort into it. And, Father, that uh, we would be drawing them home, Father, back to where they belong or to a right relationship with you to start with. Father, that we would be doing exactly what your son Jesus told us to do, to love. Father, for without love, then it's just a, it's a waste of time. So help us to love those who are out there who do not have you, Help us to love those that were with us and are no longer here now and draw them back in. And, Father, help us in our attempts to, to regain the lost. Father, without your Holy Spirit moving and acting, Father, every effort we make will just be wasted. So I ask that your Holy Spirit would work through your people, through the new laborers and through ourselves, to reach those who are truly lost to reach those who have left us. And Father, we'll give you all the praise, glory, and honor for what you do. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and continue to worship. The reason we go to the lost is because we have the good news of the gospel. That gospel is that salvation belongs to our God, that Jesus defeated death, and that faith in him is what saves we should be glad because of that. Amen? Let's sing about it. Let the glory of the Lord forever be our joy. May redemption be the theme of our song. For by grace we have been saved, and by grace we shall proclaim to the corners of the earth that Christ has come. Through the ages gone before, through the trial and the storm, many saints and martyrs conquered, though they died. Still we're holding out Crossing ocean, suffering loss Shall endure all things to win the crown of life Let the nations be glad Let the people rejoice For salvation belongs to our God And let the whole earth be 
filled with the praises of the Lord, for salvation belongs to our God. Let the nations be glad. As your holy church goes forth in the Holy Spirit's power, with the glories of the gospel to exclaim now we pray now we pray your kingdom come and we pray your will be done for the honor and the glory of your name let the nations be glad let the people rejoice for salvation belongs to our God. And let the whole earth be filled with the praises of the Lord. For salvation belongs to our God. Let the nations be glad. Sing that one more time. Let the nations, let the nations be glad. Let the people rejoice, for salvation belongs to our God. Let the whole earth be filled with the praises of the Lord, for salvation belongs. To our God, let the nations be glad. Just if you'll have a seat real quick, we appreciate you spending time with us this morning as we pray, as we worship, as we re announce our reliance upon the Lord. We're going to end with a final video this morning, a video of prayers for the United States. This will be... Our benediction, once the video was done, we are dismissed. We'll watch, and then we go. Let us, young and old, join together, as did the First Continental Congress, in the first step in humble heartfelt prayer. Let us do so for the love of God and His great goodness, in search of His guidance and the grace of repentance. Almighty Father, if it is Your holy will that we shall obtain a place and name among the nations of the earth, grant that we may be enabled to show our gratitude for Your goodness by our endeavors to fear and obey you. Save us from violence, discord, and confusion, from pride and arrogance, and from every evil way. Defend our liberties, and fashion into one united people the multitude brought hither out of many kindreds and tongues. Endow with your spirit of wisdom those whom in your name we entrust the authority of government that there may be justice and peace at home, and that through obedience to your law, we may show forth your praise among the nations of the earth. In time of prosperity, fill our hearts with thankfulness, and in the day of trouble, suffer not our trust in you to fail. With malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right as you give us to see the right, let us finish the work we are in to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle, and for his widow, and for his orphans. Continue to guide and sustain us in the great unfinished tasks of achieving peace, justice, and understanding among all men and nations, and of ending misery and suffering wherever they exist. For we are given power not to advance our own purposes, nor to make a great show in the world, nor a name. There is but one just use of power, and it is to serve people. Help us to remember it, Lord. 
God be with us as you were with our fathers. May you not leave us or forsake us, so that we may incline our hearts to you to walk in all your ways, that all peoples of the earth may know that the Lord is God. There is no other. Amen.